I'd like to now introduce our first speaker. Brian Howe is a president of Master Plans, a business plan writing company with over 10,000 funding ready business plans developed. Master Plans has helped raise millions of dollars for entrepreneurs, creating thousands of jobs and opportunities for others worldwide. Brian has a huge bank of knowledge about businesses and how to plan for them. He is going to give us some of what he has learned throughout his unique background, including the four biggest mistakes of business planning. Please welcome Brian Howe. Thank you. Thank you. There was only one incorrect thing there, which she said a bank of knowledge is a bank of worthless knowledge. So, pardon me, I'm not that much of a public speaker, so I'll try my best, but, um, and as you know, from the Colby event, I'm a nine quick start, so that means I made this presentation about 30 minutes ago. <laughs> With that, uh, when Barry asked me to do this, he said, um, hey, you know, try to keep it light, try to keep it lively, and I said, Barry, this business planning, I mean, this is like maybe the most boring subject matter on the planet. I said, well, you know, uh, just try to, you know, have some common stories and things that people would like to hear about, and I said, well, okay. I said, do I have to go through what a business plan is? Uh, he said, yeah. You know, maybe touch on what's the key elements of a business plan are, right? I said, okay. Um, so? <laughs> so your business plan is your executive summary company structure, description, product and service, market industry analysis, marketing plan, management over your five-year financials, including, but not necessarily, your profitless cash flow and balance sheet. There you go, Barry. So before we start talking about what a uh, business plan is, um, I want to show you a short clip of Entourage that kind of talks about where my clients come from. What's up? I'm looking for funding for a business idea that I have. Did you go to a bank? Yeah. Whoops. What's up? I'm looking for funding for a business idea that I have. Did you go to a bank? Yeah. They laughed in my face because I have no collateral. Did you tell them about your hat collection? Come on, Ari. You live with a guy who just gave you a quarter million dollar car. You need money, go to him. I'm trying to do this on my own. Coming here asking me for money, it's not doing it on your own. No, 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 I'm not asking you for money. I'm asking you to put me in touch with people who invest in businesses, and I know you know those kinds of people. You stuck with Vince through all the rough times. Now he's on Easy Street, and you want to branch out on your own? You two have a fight? No. I just think it's... Time for me to make something of myself. Turtle, do you know what it takes to make something of yourself? I mean, come on. I worked a job through college and grad school. Lloyd! Yes, Mr. Gold. Hit the stack. In front of people, I am not performing. The Kingdom of Foibles. The Kingdom of Foibles, written by Karen Brown. A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court meets Die Hard. A man awakes in the midst of a This crusade. man can quote from the entire stack. That is what he's willing to put in for his own success. He's paying his dues. When have you paid yours? I'm willing to pay him now, and I have a great idea. So do all these idiots. Can you execute it? I think I can. In this life, no one is going to invest because you think you can. Do you have a business plan? No, I mean, I haven't sat down and put... What do you need? Office space, insurance, how many employees? What do you project to earn? What do you need to break even? At what point can your investors see some profit? Oh, no! Oh. Look, when my son was born, my greatest fear was having this conversation. I knew that I would give him anything he wanted because he was my son, and I couldn't say no, which sucks, because it wouldn't help him, and he'd just end up on the street doing heroin with the two Corys because I was too much of a pussy to teach him a lesson. I won't make that mistake with you. Just say no. I could pull this off, Ari. Come back to me when you can prove it. case is looking for is an extra what we call an external business plan something that's going to be outward looking something where you're going to give it to somebody so you can ask them for some kind of money 
There's two types of plans, and I think everybody in here, actually I doubt anybody in, well not anybody, but I, most people in here don't have an external facing business plan, because you really don't need one, because we're already in business, right? What you probably have is some form of an internal plan. So what I've included here is essentially my company's business plan, which is just our dashboard that runs inside of our CRM, uh, that allows me to track everything from, uh, in a date period, time, closed, by level, leads by gender, that kind of thing. So this updates our own internal business plan all the time. But what an external plan is used for is any investment of capital, uh, which could be a bank, debt, investor's equity, immigration, little known fact, you can buy your uh, US citizenship if you invest enough money in America. Um, partnerships, essentially what Turtle was asking Ari for, which is, hey, help me out, help me find investors. And then of course time, free consulting is what I call it, because people are like, hey, will you be on my board of advisors and dedicate a bunch of time that goes nowhere? Sure. So here's kind of what an external plan <laughs> here's kind of what an external plan kind of looks like. It's a bunch of marketing material. It's all pretty and fluffy. These are the things that we create for our clients. So when I put this together, I was going to come up with uh, the four big external plan mistakes that I think most of our clients make from experiencing roughly 10,000 of them now. Um, the first mistake that most people make is they underestimate the cost of everything. Um, you know who the biggest cost underestimator in the business planning world is? No. Adam? Your employees, right? The reason I include in this picture, because this is your employees. They're all sitting out having burritos right now, right? <laughs> this conversation is going to happen about 2,500 times today somewhere in Portland, where they're going to sit around and be like, oh, man, that Brian guy is printing money. You know he is. Well, let's do the math. Let's do the, how, how much is labor? How much do you think the labor costs? Well, I'm making, I'm making 50. He's actually making 60, but you can't be the richest guy at the table. Well, I'm making 30. Well, you're actually making 25, but you can't be the poorest guy at the table. And then they do this weird math where they say, uh, well, if I average it out, that's like 30. OK, so 30. <laughs> and how many employees do we got? Uh, with like 23, closer to 30. Uh, so that means payroll's what? Every two weeks, all the uh, 25 grand? Closer to 55. I'm like, OK, so, so there's that. And then uh, we, we got rent. And, uh, and uh, how much is rent? Well, we got a nice office. It's about uh, 3,000 square feet, closer to 4,500. And it's about a dollar. What do you think rent is? About $1.50 a square foot, closer to three bucks triple net. I don't care about all that triple net stuff. Let's just, what else we got? That's it. That's all Brian's cost. The guy's printing money. Oh, no, wait. Uh, they pay somebody else. What is it? Marketing company I'm trying to remember. Google. <laughs> Forgot about them. So Brian says our marketing costs are really high. How much is it? Well, it must be about, I mean, it's a lot. It's probably 15 to 25 grand a month, closer to 90. And this is how this math starts. And entrepreneurs do the same thing. So they sit down and they pencil all this stuff out. So when you're planning, uh, plan like an employer, not like an employee. Entrepreneurial hyper-optimism, also known as EHO. Um, <laughs> when we talk to clients, a lot of times they'll say something like, you know, it, it's just a $1 trillion industry. If I could just get, you know, about 3% of that. You know, <laughs> uh, a good case of this, so I was at the Portland Seed Fund uh, presentation stuff last week, and this company was giving a presentation on uh, how they have um, a ticketing software for TriMet, right? So they say, well, there's a, it's a $3 billion industry. $3 billion worth of TriMet tickets are bought uh, you know, every, every year. And if we could just get 25% of those tickets to be purchased through our smartphone app, and then they have this huge valuation number. And I'm sitting next to this angel investor, and he says, he says wow, that's a pretty good presentation, don't you think? I'm like, well, when's the last time you rode TriMet? And you think there's a bunch of smartphones rolling around? A guy asked me for a buck fifty on the way here. Now he's rolling around with a $100 data plan? You know? <laughs> he's going to buy this app where his iDroid 7, and you know, all of a sudden he's just got buying all his tickets. And the other problem is, is if I can just buy it whenever I want, why wouldn't I just wait for Faircop and then buy it? That's what Joe Squires would do. <laughs> <laughs> he's, not pay, he's not prepaying if he doesn't have to. Okay? I have no competition. It's my other favorite one. Roy Jones had no competition, but that certainly looks like competition on his left eye. Uh, so a lot of times when we take in a client, we send them a questionnaire and we say, hey, um, you know, send this back, preferably fill it all out completely, let us cut it, paste it, and send it back to you so we don't have to do anything. But if you will just send it back to us, then we'll extrapolate from there. And their usual response is, okay, I have no competition. So that's the first point where we say, really? Everybody has competition. It may not be direct competition, but everybody has competition. For us, every time we have this quarterly strategy meeting, my marketing guy is like, we've got to talk about our growth and growth and growth. Our number one direct competitor who also writes business plans 
uh, for people. I'm thinking, oh, forget about them. Um, the real competition for us is software, right? Because the more that a software can make it seem like you don't need me, and the more I hate them, then the more uh, we lose clients. So my biggest problem is if somebody like Palo Alto or Xeon or one of these other softwares continues to pump out all these professional systems to uh, obviate the need for a consult. So my biggest competitor is software. It's a friendly competitor, but that's our biggest competitor. So you always have competition. Incorrect market analysis. I don't mean uh, too little or too much, just incorrect. So one of my favorite stories is a guy here. Um, I can't say his name, I guess. But he had a really good idea. One of the best ideas I've seen in about five years. What he had done is he had created, he had a patent on the ability to reduce uh, GPS coordinates to um, essentially like a phone number. So any reasonable GPS coordinate. So it wouldn't do the middle of the uh, plains in South Dakota, but it would do any restaurant or house or, or anything like that. And what you could do is you could purchase essentially your 1-800 number for your GPS location. So, and it's a skin that would just overlay any smartphone, GPS device, or whatever. So what you would do is say, hey, um, come over to my house, what's your address? And instead of the painful process of being like, well, I'm at 19655 Southwest Kalaskachapwachi Street, and you're sitting there like, I don't know how to spell that. Instead, you just say 17745647. It's like, oh, this is this guy's house. Seemed pretty brilliant to me. Um, so we send him his plan, and he calls me up, and he's like, oh, I can't believe I got this piece of crap plan from you. What are, what are you talking about? I mean, I think I read through your plan. It's great ideas. One of the best ideas I've heard in a long time. You have a patent on it. You've already coded all the, the uh, coordinates. What's wrong with the plan? He said, well, my market analysis isn't, isn't anything I could ever possibly present to an investor. I'm like, dude, your market analysis is a lot. That's it. That's all there has to be. He's like, no, how in the world could I ever present this without knowing how many phones and GPS units there are in the BRIC countries in five years? It's like, well, I can give you the answer. It's a lot. Um, in all my years of doing this, no investor has ever been turned around by market analysis. If it's not obvious when somebody comes to you about the potential market, is there's no amount of research that you're going to show them that all of a sudden they'll be like, you know what? That is a good idea now. So anyway, I fired the guy, gave him all his money back, called him an idiot. Um, my favorite market analysis of all time is this guy, Carlos Nelson. In 2005, um, I was still taking all the sales calls. This guy calls and he says, he said, Brian Howe, this is Carlos Nelson in Alaska. Carlos Nelson needs Brian Howe to come to Alaska. I'm like, <laughs> Carlos has a penchant for talking in the third person. So I'm like, uh, who's Carlos? I'm Carlos. OK, because he threw me there. <laughs> <laughs> I said, so what do I need to come for Alaska for? He said, there's no way you could understand my business if you don't come to Alaska. I'm like, um, you know, we've done this a lot of times. I'm pretty sure I could figure it out from here. He's like, nope, 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 I've got to put you on the plane. I said, OK, well, if you pay my exorbitant fee and send me money, I'll come to Alaska. Because I hate Alaska. Vegas, I might go for free. Alaska, you're paying. Right? So he's like, OK. He says, I'll meet you on the tarmac. I'm like, well, tarmac? I'm like, what, what's wrong with the gate? Off the phone. Get on the plane. We fly up to Alaska. Land. Starts taxiing up to the gate. And the plane stops. We're all sitting there in the middle of the taxiway, and all of a sudden it comes over the, the loudspeaker. like, can passenger Brian Howe please come to the front of the plane? <laughs> OK. So it's important to know he has an aircraft maintenance business. So he obviously calls in that I'm a passenger on this plane. So I walk up to the front of the plane, and this giant bull in my head is just peering at me through the portal, <laughs> grinning from ear to ear. Right? So they open up, you guys, hey, Brian! And he's like 6'6", six, six, right? So he puts me in this bear hug, he's shaking me, and my bag's hanging, my feet are about six inches off the ground. It's like, I'm so happy you're here, Brian. Carlos, I'm so happy you're here. <laughs> so he drops me down, and I'm like, well, OK, Carlos, I'm happy to be here. So what can I do for you? He's like, well, I, you, you got to see this. So we'll start working on the business plan tonight. It's like, tonight? It's like 6 o'clock. Why don't we start in the morning? Nope, it's got to be tonight. OK, so he drives me to the hotel, drops me off. I go in, change, waiting for him to call. 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, nothing. 8 o'clock, I get some dinner. Go back to my room, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, now I'm going to bed. 2 o'clock in the morning, phone rings. Hello? He's like, he's like, Carlos Nelson's outside. Carlos Nelson's outside. <laughs> <laughs> Carlos Nelson's outside, he needs Brian to come outside. <laughs> I'm like, Carlos, it's like 2 in the morning, man. What are you doing? He's like, come outside. So I got, so I get in his navigator, and we drive to Ted Stevens Airport. Now, Ted Stevens Airport is one of the biggest shipping airports in the world because somehow, economically, fuel wise, I don't remember. It's easier to go up to Alaska and down fuel-wise for big cargo jets. And he's out of uh, Ted Stevens in Anchorage. So we drive to the airport. The 9-11 thing is complete BS because we pass right by everything and, and we're weaving in and out of the 747s. Nobody asked. Nobody stopped us. Nobody asked anything. 
So we go to his little mechanic shop. We get out. It's freezing. It's like 10 degrees, and it's just snowing. 10 minus 10, and it's just like snowing like crazy. It's like Carlos Brian, Brian needs to see this to understand Carlos's business. So I get out there, standing there, freezing, and I'm like, "What am I? What are we doing here, Carlos?" He's like, just look at this. And it is kind of an awesome site. I mean, there's a huge FedEx base there, and there's just 747 after 747 landing and taking off in the middle of all the snow and stuff. And in the middle of all this, there's all this de-icing going on, right? Because we're planning to take off. If it gets too ice, then there's no lift. Boom. So he says, now watch this. So all these 747s are on. There's these five trucks, you know, rolling around like little ants, spraying all these planes. And then he's like, watch this plane in particular. So I'm watching this plane, guys comes out, de-ice it, waits, 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 taxis around, comes around, and then it gets de-iced again before it takes off. So the business model is, for this company, they have 10 de-icing trucks. They always say five are under repair. So they can sit there and say that they're too slow. And of course, since it's, not the, it's the pilot's ass on the line, he's always going to get de-iced again. So they're shooting these planes twice at about $15,000 a shoot. And the stuff that they're spraying on these wings costs or is $15, but it only costs them like three bucks. It's a huge markup. So he's like, if I, had, if I had enough money to get 10 de-icing trucks, I could take over this entire market because everybody hates this company called Swissport that's doing all this stuff. I said, well, OK. So I had to stand out here and freeze my ass off at 2 o'clock in the morning. Why didn't you just say you wanted de-icing trucks? Because you wouldn't have understood it. So we went back. We wrote the plan. Uh, he ended up getting his money and uh, got small business of the year. And then the results were crazy is accurate. Uh, Eric, so he struck it rich. He sold the company in 2009 to a Native American organization, and uh, now he calls me. He just texted me from Venice the other day asking if I can get him Kanye West sneakers. <laughs> Brian, Carlos knows Brian is in Oregon, and Nike is in Oregon. Can you give me some Kanye West sneakers? No, Carlos, I can't get you some Kanye sneakers. <laughs> okay, so in short, in the end, uh, plan like an employer, avoid hyper optimism, uh, don't uh, forget about your competition, and do a correct market analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Oh.